Darren. I'd like to call this meeting of the Public Services Committee Tuesday, June 12th, 2012 to order. First uh, agenda item will be review and approval of minutes dated May 8th, 2012. Move approval, Erpenbach. Second, Aguilar. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that passes. Uh, the first item on the agenda will be uh, an update of the naming rights ordinance by Director Darren Smith. Good afternoon once again. Uh, what I have uh, handed out is, um, well, a topic that we've been visiting about for some time now is uh, trying to find a way to improve the naming rights ordinance that we currently have as a city. Um, we have an ordinance in place. I think most of us would agree it just, it you know, times change and it needs to be more comprehensive. and. And there are uh, more and more opportunities we're seeing, not only with the event center, which we just talked about, but as we grow as a community, um, there's just going to be more and more opportunities for uh, naming rights and uh, other things for our public facilities. So we wanted to look at how do we put a comprehensive ordinance in place that really more than anything equips city staff and the city council, I think, with some direction, uh, put some rules in place to make these types of decisions. So if we're talking about naming buildings, whether it's inside, outside, public buildings, uh, streets, parks, uh, you name it, um, even commemorating some things, uh, it, I think it really is best if we have uh, a comprehensive and detailed ordinance in place to help guide all of us and have a fair process for those who, uh, who seek any one of these things. So many months ago, we did go out, uh, myself and with the assistance of the city attorney's office, to uh, seek out what other communities have done, uh, cities and counties, for naming rights ordinances. And uh, we, found, we found several, although I think we thought that we would find even more as we looked across the country, but we did find several. Um, one of them I would say that rose to the top pretty quickly that uh, I liked and felt was very comprehensive and could be um, applicable here uh, for our needs was an ordinance in Omaha. And so um, as we've continued to work through that, uh, what you have in front of you today is um, a draft ordinance, but it's very rough. This is basically the Omaha ordinance uh, put into Sioux Falls ordinance format. Uh, and then we have tweaked a few things to make it again, more applicable and appropriate uh, for Sioux Falls in particular. And, and if we can, I'd like to walk through this briefly. You'll also note that there are some highlighted areas in here, and I want to touch on them uh, just briefly. Uh, so again, in the first, uh, the first section of this uh, proposed ordinance in Omaha, it does specifically say this article is not intended to govern the naming of an interior space in a building or a smaller structure, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that clearly is one we want to highlight because uh, my understanding from the council and my, my personal opinion would be that we do want an ordinance that provides direction for the inside of facilities. I, I, I think that is something that we do definitely need. Whatever the details end up being on that, I think it's something that needs to be debated and addressed. Then as you turn and go inside, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the naming committee that would be established with an ordinance like this um, you can see the makeup of that planning director, public works director, police chief, fire chief, parks and rec director, library, and then three citizens. I think that's a good group. I think that's appropriate. Uh, again, that's something we can continue to discuss. Uh, but I did highlight uh, they have the planning director serving as chairperson. And just wanted to note that that's something, of course, you have to visit with, uh, uh, well, for starters, with the planning director um, and the mayor to make sure that is uh, 
uh, you know, an appropriate use of our staff resources and which position would be serving as the chairperson. But in Omaha, it is the planning director. And as you look through here, I think that very well may be appropriate for us as well. Um, one other thing, uh, again, I highlighted in here is in, in this ordinance in Omaha, it provided the opportunity for a member listed, uh, in other words, one of the citizens, one of the three citizens, in his or her absence to be represented at the meeting um, of the committee and vote on their behalf. And I, I just flagged that as, uh, that struck me as just somehow uh, inappropriate or uh, something that I'm not sure we would want uh, to do. Um, then again, as you flip the page and continue in the next section, um, I did add, this was not in the Omaha ordinance, so this is just uh, my attempt at adding language here um, that cannot be found in this ordinance, and that is uh, that all terms and conditions as part of an application to rename whatever it is, all terms and conditions of proposed naming or renaming, including all financial and other relevant terms, must be disclosed. Uh, now again, that's one of the things we're gonna have to work through, and we are impacting other organizations. Uh, this will affect the pavilion, the zoo, and others. And I'll get to that in a moment as far as working with those groups. But again, I think those are the types of things that we need to know, uh, you know, what is being proposed to put somebody's uh, name on a public uh, facility, a public asset, a taxpayer-funded asset. I think we need to know what those terms are before we can determine what is the fair value uh, for naming that. Again, Planning Department Review, I just highlighted. Again, this would probably rest with the department of the director who chairs the, the city um, naming committee. Uh, city Council Member Review, I flagged this, again, thinking uh, you might find this uh, inappropriate here. Uh, Omaha is structured a little differently than we are here and this would uh, have it going to an individual council member. Um, and as you know, we have at large, we have three at large citywide positions. Uh, we do have five district positions, but this would have uh, one council member for that specific area go, you know, going to them. And I, I so I flag that. Um, I think as you go through the rest of this, what you'll find is some of the things that I've highlighted are really just uh, in duplicate of what I've already pointed out as far as which department will administer it, the position that would chair the, the city committee. But overall, I think what you'll find in reading this is that it is very comprehensive, it's very thorough, and it provides a number of processes to go through. So again, when somebody makes application to name a street, a facility, whether it's external or hopefully internal as well, uh, parks, library, fire station, police department, whatever, it has to go through a thorough process, be fully vetted. It starts at the staff level with application and a report, goes to the city naming committee made up of city staff and citizens. Uh, then it goes, uh, depending on what's being proposed to be named, if it's a park, for example, it, it would go to the parks board, um, it could go through other boards that they would require it to go through even before it comes to them. Uh, and then ultimately it would go to the city council uh, for their approval. Um, one of the suggestions I would make as we go forward uh, is that um, I would propose that we put a small work group together because this ordinance will impact a number of departments a number of public facilities who are managed by private third parties. Again, the zoo and pavilion would be a couple examples. I would propose we put a small work group together. We've got a tremendous head start uh, with this draft ordinance. I think it's a matter of uh, working through the language, tweaking it, and getting it ready to come to the council for their consideration and approval. Uh, but I do think we wanna work with these other organizations. They are our partners in managing our public facilities. We wanna do this with them and find a way to do this that I think uh, is gonna work for everybody. Uh, so I would just uh, throw out uh, in terms of uh, maybe those that could be part of a work group um, with the committee's permission would be myself, uh, somebody from planning, somebody from public works, parks, the library. Um, Councilmember Anders, I know you've had a strong interest in this, so I, I put your name on the list, but somebody from the council. 
uh, and then Jim David. Um, uh, and, and of course the city attorney's office would support all of us through this, but um, to me that'd be a good way to approach this and get something that works for everybody and, and a real improvement over what we have today. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions from committee members? Councilor Aguilar? Darren, has there been any discussion with any of those uh, groups that will be affected by this? Not necessarily about this. Now, we've made reference as we've been working through in the past year, working through agreements, new agreements with, for example, the pavilion and, and zoo in particular. Uh, we've made reference to this being a current issue that does need to be addressed and resolved and uh, basically just told them that when we get to that point, we will involve them. Uh, we would not, you know, attempt to do something without them. They've made it clear this is something that would affect how they, uh, you know, how they function going forward in some of these areas. They understand, I think, what we're attempting to do, and we understand their concerns as well. So, um, so are you saying then that this small work group would then put together a proposal, and then it, yeah. you would take it to those groups? Yeah, my thought process on this is that this work group would invite uh, each of these entities in and sit down and basically go through this with them, find out what their concerns are, if they have suggestions for how things could be worded better. Again, we're not trying to hamstring them in any way, shape, or form. It's in our best interest for them to be successful in this area. But at the same time, at the end of the day, the city council and all those groups below, including staff, you know, you're really the, response, the ultimate responsibility for making sure that what happens with public facilities and assets that are taxpayer supported does rest with the council and city officials. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I got a couple here, Darren. Uh, per our discussions that we had, yep. uh, also including uh, Jim David, mm -hmm. uh, discuss why this needs to be updated as far as some of the things that have happened in the past couple of years. Yeah, I, I think, you know, what I would say is um, there have just been examples where we've seen uh, things being sponsored inside, for example, inside public facilities um, that, uh, again, I think were done with the best interests of the facility and the mission of those facilities. Uh, it, but it just really, I think, struck us as something that, I'll go back to what I said a moment ago, at the end of the day, ultimately, it is the city council, uh, council and, and city officials who are tasked with the responsibility of making sure that what happens with our public facilities uh, is our responsibility. And when you talk about putting people's names on buildings and then there's values attached to that, or maybe uh, the terms of those deals and those types of things, uh, we just wanna make sure that what's being done is fully vetted, that more than one person somewhere agrees with what's being done. Uh, these are assets of the taxpayers and uh, they, need, they need to be managed appropriately. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Also, I guess I'll comment on this is that with the city council taking over approvals of contracts, that this is something that we definitely need to update and continue to monitor. Um, so our next step would to be putting together a committee. Yeah, to, I'd like to put together to a work this. group. Yep, and if the council would just inform me of who on the council, you know, would be your prep. Everybody's pointing at Councilor Anderson Jr. <laughs> uh, so if you're if you've been chosen, we'll put a work group together. And the first step I think would be to meet as a work group. I have started getting input recently from all of the other city departments and there has been, there have been some, has been some good input. So I wanna to continue to get that, but get this work group together as soon as possible. And then as soon as possible after that, start reaching out to some of these uh, organizations um, and meeting with them and firming this thing up. I think we got a really good head start and uh, then we'll bring it back to the council for their consideration and approval uh, at some point. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I would ask if there's any public comment on this issue. I see none. Uh, any comments from the committee members? Motion? I think maybe to table this for until the committee 
I would move to defer it until the work group comes back with um, more activity for us or more input for us. Second. All right, with that being said, all in favor say aye. Aye. And that passes. <clears throat> Next will be the distracted driving ordinance alternatives. Uh, Councilor Michelle Erfenbach. Councilor Aguilar is the point person on this project, and the two of us okay. have been kind of, she's better at it. I'm though. reading my red notes, so, and your name's there, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then, Councilor Aguilar, would you like to speak to this? Yes. Um, Jim David has put together a long wor working with Keith Allen, um, Keith Allenstein from the city attorney's office, three draft possibilities as far as ordinances, as far as the distracted driving um, issue. Jim did quite a bit of research uh, looking at other municipalities and states and as far as um, what they have proposed. And um, he has pretty much divided them into three areas, a handheld band with, where texting is prohibited and is a primary offense. Um, and in that handheld band, they, the device is prohibited uh, using uh, handheld devices prohibited but considered a secondary offense. Then there's the texting ban, handheld ban for those under 18 years. Um, texting is prohibited along with uh, the ban of the use of handheld in school and construction zones for all of those that are 18 years uh, or younger, under 18 years. And in this um, sample ordinance, both are listed as a primary offense. And the third example, uh, texting is prohibited along with a ban on the use of handhelds in school and construction zones. And both are listed as a primary offense. Also, uh, the city attorney's office has requested that we include in this cleanup language to the speed zone ordinance. Uh, section 40-138, the proposed ordinance strikes the requirement to have reduced construction speed signs present, on, present only when workers are present. And as we all know, that isn't complied with today. Um, and the proposal also resolves uh, conflicting language uh, when it comes to the size of the fine. Now again, these are just three suggestions that we're bringing forward to the committee along with the cleanup language and um, I believe that Councilor Erpenbach has some uh, considerations maybe for some changes um, in one of these or all of them. Well, thank you, Councilor Aguilar, because we do have three really great options to kind of work with, and we sort of tasked Jim David to do that. You know, as our legislative operations manager, we said, think through this for us. Help us figure out what are, what are some different ways to go about this. And, and he looked at, at all the states around us, and every state that touches us, that touches South Dakota except for Montana, has um, some, some sort of either handheld or texting ban. And so, I mean, the state line to Minnesota isn't that far from here, and, and uh, so it was, it was pretty obvious that, that we're kind of behind the eight ball, that we really do need to be doing something about it. So we looked at that idea that, you know, should we, should we just ban it altogether? Should we not allow you, if you're driving, you don't hold anything at all in your hands? Or should, and should we make that a primary offense or a secondary offense? We kind of looked at how the seatbelt legislation was, was first brought to South Dakota. And we also looked at then a texting ban. And um, so uh, Councilor Aguilar is right. We, we talked about, because the, the main issue in South Dakota comes down to enforcement. You know, it's difficult to, how do you, how do you know that someone's actually texting and how, that it's dangerous or whatever. And so one of the things that, that um, one of, I think that what we'll end up with is a hybrid of these three proposals. I think that in terms of um, making it, easier to enforce, we need to look at primary, making it a primary offense, um, that, that I think the, the options of, of it being a secondary offense are kind of off the table for me. It's not part of the discussion anymore. 
And then the other thing is um, that, and I struggle because Councillor Aguilar and I disagree on this. Um, we talked about whether it's a texting ban or is it a complete handheld ban? Because for me, the enforcement issue is also, am I looking for a song on my iPod or am I actually texting? What's the difference? I'm still distracted. There's still something in my hand and it's distracting me as a driver. So there's, there are those conversations to have. The other thing that I would say then before we move on is that um, Jim also did a bunch of research for us in terms of studies. And there are conflicting studies about whether this actually works or not. But in terms of reported accidents that are related to distracted driving, the numbers are down in states where this has been enacted in, in years past. In fact, um, in California, the Office of Traffic Safety is reporting overall accidents down 22% and collisions directly related to cell phone use on the road are down 47%. There is a, then an Insurance Institute um, study that suggests that it's not that big a deal, but that looks at actual claims, not just you know collisions and accidents and those kinds of things. So there are some conversations to have about effectiveness, but I think that we've come to that point where we know that this is something we have to do, and, and we're at a point where this committee kind of needs to put these three hybrids together and figure out what that proposal is going to be. I do have a couple questions for Keith, if he would come forward. My first question has to deal with reading the ordinances. Bicycles were included. Um, could you explain why? Um, that was that came to me, um, as you guys have indicated. Uh, Jim David came up with the initial language. That was the language that was in there. Uh, I cleaned up. Uh, there was a reference to quadricycles and uh, motorcycles in there, which the motorcycles is covered by motor vehicles. Um, so I was, the bicycle portion uh, was in there originally. I wasn't aware of whether, what the council's intention was, whether they wanted that to apply to this or not, uh, as far as bicycles go. But uh, so I, I didn't really have any input other than to take out quadricycles on that so okay. I don't, I don't what's know what your the concern about it was. No, I Aguilar? just I thought we were looking at motor motorized vehicles oh. not bicycles. Going back to the debate from the earlier session is a bicycle a vehicle or not well I'm <clears throat> thinking if you're texting and biking we got a problem you also uh, forwarded to us the what looks like will be the proposed legislation that will come forward from the study group for the state and um, the, so the only changes then that they're proposing, it has to do with uh, no holder of an instruction permit may use any type of wireless communication device while operating a motor vehicle upon the public highways. Um, and then that's in two different sections, I believe. But they didn't recommend any other changes? I, I think it's directed basically at the, at the less experienced drivers. Okay. Thank you. I do have, uh, <clears throat> no, I think that did answer my question. Okay. Thank you. Then, Mr. Chair, if I might, uh, something else to think about, and this was just actually in our local newspaper recently, um, Transportation Secretary, the Federal Transportation Secretary, Ray LaHood, is in the process of creating a national distracted driving initiative, you know, it, and we've talked about this before, that it's going to come to a point where if you don't have some sort of law in your state regarding texting or cell phone use that you're going to lose federal transportation dollars. Well, I think, again, we said this before, that, that we in Sioux Falls can be sort of that model for the rest of the state. I'd just really like to see us move forward with this. Um, I don't know where you want to go from here. Do you want us to draft a little bit more, or what, what do you think? Well, after taking a look at this, I think that maybe another meeting to really firm up exactly the direction we would like to try to go into and uh, then bring that back in July mm -hmm. for a presentation in front of this committee. And then we can decide if we want to move that on to the city council. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd also like to have Jim present because mm -hmm. he did a lot of research and I'd like to hear from him too. 
Well, to uh, his credit, you know, he's on vacation this week. He did a ton of work for us, and he did say to me the other day, I'm going to be gone, and I, if you guys have any questions, you need to call me. And I'm like, I'm not going to call you when you're on vacation. We can report this and then move on from there. So know that he is very into this project with us. So. And I've had a lot of comments from citizens for and against, but I do believe that this is something that we need to continue to look at and maybe even further conversations through our city attorney's office with the state committee to you know ensure that the direction we are going in is the same direction as the state and then we may you know we may go a lot further than what the state does but we are as being the largest city i think that this is more than just a, an issue for inexperienced drivers I think that we, I, I myself even catch myself looking at my smartphone every once in a while. And since this has come up, I always just try to keep my hands off of it when I'm driving. So I would like to see this discussed further and uh, brought back up into the July meeting. <clears throat> would you like any further work to be done prior to that? Or, I mean, is there something that from the three that we've seen, I know that Councillor uh, Karski isn't here today and so we won't have his input but um would you like to see any other drafts or or how or would you just like to give the committee members more time to read through the, what we have at this point and then wait until next um meeting to kind of work through what we'd like to present to the council well, I think the next step would be working with the organization and the group that brought this to us also and getting their input to see if there's any changes they feel that may be needed on the ordinances that we're going to propose. I think Mr. Lauer, I know, is out of the country right now, and uh, I think that we need to give them the opportunity to take a look at the three proposed ordinances and those changes and get their input also. Mr. Lauer did have the opportunity to look at, and I think he did send an email, I don't know if he sent it to the entire committee, as to looking at the three proposals, um, which you know, was number one choice, number two, but also suggestions for a revision making primary Correct. offenses. Um, I just spoke to him right before he left, and in our discussion, it did come up as far as he was not going to be here today, and I would like to give him that opportunity to come back and give us a, a final uh, presentation or his final comments on this before we move it forward. Mr. Chair, I know there are people also from that group that are here today. Maybe you want to ask them to. I, you thought of that already. I apologize. That will be next. All yes. right. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. With that, any public comment? On this anyone that would like to comment on this issue hello members of the committee Greg Boris from South Dakota Voices for Children I'm a member of the group that Rich Flower uh, has headed up and I, I really think it's great that you're wrestling with this and I look forward to uh, visiting with other members of the group on the, the alternatives that you uh, discussed today I want to bring uh, to your attention something that keeps coming up and that's the state group that's meeting on this and the state group is the safe teen driving task force it has nothing to do with texting per se it has nothing to do with adults per se it comes from legislation that passed in the 2011 uh, legislature that created a safe teen driving task force to look at how can we reduce the deaths and major uh, injuries that have uh, come upon teens in this state that are out of proportion with those that teens in uh, neighboring states. Certainly texting and handheld devices are part of that. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to not look at uh, the, the work of that task force as being uh, uh, an attempt to, uh, to influence what's going on for adults, which is what this ordinance would, would do. Next week, next Tuesday, the task force will be meeting again. I believe it's Tuesday or Wednesday, sometime next week, and, and they'll be looking at specific legislation and hearing some more presentations on what uh, teens think about 
uh, driving and how can, it ha uh, how can that be made more safe. But I think what we're doing here in Sioux Falls is much broader in scope and uh, also probably should be addressed statewide, but you know, one step at a time. Thank you for your, doing your, your work on this. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Oh, okay. Anyone else like to make a comment? Chairman, members of the committee, uh, my name is Dick Gregerson. I've been working with uh, Mr. Lauer uh, on this matter. I'm very, uh, I'm very interested in getting something done uh, in this area because I think it's uh, it's a real problem that most states have dealt with and and that we have not. And uh, I just uh, wanted to. I know uh, in talking to Mr. Lauer that one of the things we wanted is have it as a primary offense. As a secondary defense, uh, we still have that, you know, in South Dakota with our seat bills. And so uh, we would uh, encourage uh, this committee and the council to make it a primary offense that goes forward. Another thing, uh, I'm also, uh, I'm chairman of the South Dakota Highway Commission, and I can tell you it's a real problem of uh, keeping our work areas safe because the workers are right next to you know, to moving traffic, and we lower the speed limit way down, but a lot of people don't pay much attention. And you haven't got many feet to vary. And if you're texting going through those construction areas, it's, it's really dangerous. And uh, the last item, I don't know if a lot of people might not realize it, for years we've had on the books, you cannot have a TV set or a screen in the front seat that can be observed by a driver of a car. Now, I don't know of one conviction for that. And uh, I don't know of, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we have that, and I don't think anyone would realistically say, you know, we've never had a conviction. Let's repeal that law uh, and let them watch, uh, you know, TV while they're driving. So this is, I think we have recognized when it comes to uh, having your ability to pay attention to where you're going, we have done that in the, uh, with the TVs, and it seems to me a logical extension of that uh, to also do it to texting. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Oh. Uh, I do have a question. I see uh, Assistant Chief Lyons in the back. Uh, could I have you come up, please? Patty Lyon. Thank you. Um, you know, we've, we've been discussing a lot on how hard it is going to be for law enforcement to uh, enforce this. And if, if these laws do go on the books, do you believe that if it's a primary offense, it'll be easier for officers to be able to enforce those and write tickets on this? It'd be easier for us to stop them, to make, to make that traffic stop. Also, uh, when we first started this discussion, I, I believe Chief Bartell mentioned that even on the uh, accident tickets, there's nowhere to mark about distracted driving or anything like that. What would it take to change that? I'm not sure. So if maybe we could look that up and you know get a reply back Check on box that. box or something to that effect, We're, you know, um, Careless driving is already currently Purposes. used whenever somebody, uh, if they confess when, you know, we're talking with them that they, you know, inadvertently looked down or they were looking at their phone or, or looking at their GPS and that's the reason that the accident occurred, uh, we would, normally we'd mm -hmm. write them for careless driving. So that law is already on the books for those types of accidents. Uh, what you're talking about is where maybe an accident hasn't occurred. We're trying to prevent accidents. So um, being able to observe uh, that somebody is uh, using their phone or texting or whatever ordinance uh, language that you come up with, if you make it a primary uh, offense, then we would be able to make that traffic stop without having to wait for the driver to do something um, as far as a driving offense to pull that car over. So that's the difference that... Uh, I think you guys are distinguishing here uh, with the different ordinance languages. And it'll allow us to be able to track what's happening too because 
I don't believe anywhere within the state we are tracking distracted driving. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know if, if you want to, any time that somebody's written for careless driving, to me that there's must have been something that distracted them uh, to result in that ticket. So, I mean, that's one aspect that's there. But um, as far as changing how the citations are written or, you know, the language on it, that would be, I'm not sure on how that process is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? Motions, uh, how we should move forward on this? If I might, Mr. Chair, I'm just thinking, let's come back, bring it back next month, but let's bring it back as one cohesive. Based on what we've heard here, the primary offense, we'll duke it out over whether it's handheld or texting, and let's, let's come back so we've got one piece of language to deal with. You know, now that we've kind of had input, because we have had email as well on all three of these, so. But then we'll also have Mr. David back to give us a more uh, intense presentation on the final versions of what we're going to move forward with. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so Good that's your motion? motion? Yeah, it, that's yes. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that passes, and we will see that next month. <clears throat> Next will be the Concealed Weapons Ordinance, and we'll have uh, City, Assistant City Attorney Keith Allenstein to open up the discussion on this. And before we start, I want to remind the audience to please sign the attendance sheet before you leave. Thank you. Community members, Keith Allenstein, uh, City Attorney's Office. Uh, briefly, I have a real short presentation and a little bit of background. Um, this revisiting our concealed weapons ordinance came up for a couple of reasons, uh, which we'll speak about here. Um, presently, it reads, no person shall carry concealed about his or, person, his or her person uh, any pistol, other firearm, slingshot, brass knuckles or knuckles of any other material or any sandbag, dagger, bowie knife, razor, dirk knife, or other dangerous or deadly weapon or any instrument which is likely, which, or I'm sorry, which when used is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. And then it exempts out peace officers. There were two issues that, that came out of this. Um, the language there, which is offset there a little bit in red, um, it referenced any pistol or other firearm which we'll talk about here in a second, was a problem because of, of state law. And then secondly, uh, it mentions razors or any other instrument or device which is, when used, likely to produce death or great bodily harm. So those are the two um, issues that arose when we were looking at this and why we decided to go ahead and revisit this. First of all, with reference to the any pistol or other firearm, uh, presently under our city ordinance, there is no defense even if the person has a, a state-issued uh, concealed weapon permit, um, which is problematic uh, for a couple of reasons. One is state law uh, trumps us on this. There is a uh, statute here, which I have, 9-1920, which indicates that municipalities cannot further restrict firearms beyond what the state has done. So that is that is cleanup language that we have to do because our, our ordinance conflicts right now with, with this state statute. Um, and so we're, that's one of the things that we need to address. Secondly, um, it, it applies to razors or any other instrument or device which when used is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. Uh, in some senses, that's overly broad. Um, I'll, I'll explain my use of pictures here. You have a construction worker who has a box cutter on his or her person. Um, technically under the ordinance right now, a crime. Um, a woman who carries a stun gun in her purse uh, technically, that is now uh, presently under city ordinance a crime. Uh, that is a dangerous weapon by st state statute definition. Uh, if it's concealed, even for a legitimate purpose, uh, that would be uh, a crime under our present ordinance. On the other hand, we do need to have this broad language in there in other situations. Uh, uh, for that in image on the left there is supposed to be a cartoon image of Jack the Ripper. Okay, so there are situations where we want to prohibit certain people from having razors. And we need some general language in there 
um, Monica Sells was actually stabbed with a boning knife, okay, just a, uh, you know, just a regular type kitchen knife. So we need to have that broad language in there um, to cover certain situations because we can't just prohibit just the classic weapons. So uh, whether this is a solution or not, um, this is what uh, some of the language that I came up with with the help of uh, John Snyder from 605 Magazine, who is here to speak as well, um, which is, uh, he's one of the reasons also that this came forward because he had concerns that, that some of his workers um, who delivered the magazine carry box cutters and for a legitimate work purpose, uh, they're technically in violation of our ordinance. So um, I've submitted uh, to the committee the, the copy of, of the draft language and, and just real briefly here, what it's attempting to do in, in section 1A is to prohibit what we call the per se weapons, okay? The, the uh, pistol, firearm, slingshot, brass knuckles, uh, or any kind of other knuckles of any other material, sandbag, dagger, bowie knife, uh, and dirk knife. Okay, those, other than unless you have a concealed weapon permit, those are the types of weapons that, that we just don't want people to be carrying concealed because they don't really have a, a legitimate purpose. Um, in the second subsection there, we, we took the catch-all language from the, from the present ordinance and uh, included that, but, but added a qualifier that, you know, when you're talking about any other type of instrument or weapon which is likely to produce death or great bodily injury, which could be anything from a razor to a box cutter to you know, a steak knife or anything else, that it either has to be um, a device which is customarily used as or is intended for probable use as a dangerous weapon. So that way uh, we have an, an additional qualifier upon uh, these, this catch-all type of, of weapon so that we don't prohibit um, people from being able to use things for self-defense or for other other purposes. Uh, additionally then, uh, in subsection 1C and 1D, we create a couple of exemptions uh, or affirmative defenses. Uh, under subsection 1C, if you're carrying uh, a type of weapon that's, that's not of the subsection A type, the per se violated, or per se weapons, if you're carrying the kind of the, the catch-all category, so your razors and, and box cutters and that kind of thing, it's an affirmative defense if you're carrying it for purposes of your work. Okay? Uh, subsection D then is a self-defense exception, which would then apply to the situation if you have a stun gun in your purse for self-defense or things like that. Um, that allows you, again, if it's the type of weapon that is not of the per se prohibited kind, uh, as long as you're carrying it for purposes of self-defense, that would be an affirmative defense uh, to being convicted of, of this ordinance. Subsection 2 then um, brings our language into compliance with state statute, which then requires um, that you, or allows, I'm sorry, if, if you have a concealed weapon permit um, or otherwise authorized by law to carry a concealed firearm and the, and the, and the weapon that we're talking about is a firearm or a pistol, that that is... Uh, something that this ordinance does not apply to. So those people that have a concealed weapon permit can carry within the city limits. Um, subsection three then is the pocket knife exception. Uh, this probably was one of the more difficult ones to try to wrestle with. Um, basically what we're trying to do there is, is allow people to carry what's called an ordinary pocket knife. Uh, I would throw it out there for discussion. We went back and forth about using blade links. There are some states that use blade links, some don't. Uh, what we've tried to do here with the language here is, is uh, define a pocket knife as a, is a knife that, that doesn't automatically open up. So it's not a push button, which is generally known as a switch blade. Uh, so, you know, you have, op you have open assist knives and things like that so that, you know, you can kind of, it helps open or you can flip them open. Those would still be legal. It's just a straight push button uh, where the knife either, the blade either goes out or flips out automatically with the push of a button that would be still prohibited under the ordinance. Um, on subsection four, um, you see this in a lot of, of, of ordinances uh, or state laws that, as they've been updated, uh, allows you to, to carry concealed weapons in your own house. We're now to legislate what people do in their own houses as far as this goes. Uh, and then uh, subsection five just takes the prior peace officer exception and just moves it down down there. So, um, that is what our attempt to do uh, turned out, that's the way it turned out. Um, what we've tried to do is is take our ordinance, which was, which was very broad, and you know, quite arguably, you know, the officers have shown a lot of, officers have discretion to enforce or not enforce, and I think they've done a very good job of, of making 
the right choices there. Um, but what this does is, you know, kind of restricts that discretion a little bit, um, provides maybe some peace of mind for people who have concerns about, well, I'm technically in violation of an ordinance, even though maybe, you know, an officer wouldn't arrest me or wouldn't, you know, would choose to exercise his or her discretion. Uh, it it kind of lays it out there to give uh, citizens some peace of mind and clarifies some of that broad language. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I have one, Keith. Um, subsection three that talks about pocket knives. Yes. Uh, just sort of came to mind. How about the uh, straight hunting knives that are carried in sheaths on your belt? How do they fall into all of this? Is it a concealed weapon if it's inside its sheath, or I would say if inside a sheath, I don't, I haven't actually researched that, but it's not carried. It's it's not considered concealed as far as a, a firearm goes if it's in a holster. So I've got to believe the same logic would apply to a hunting knife in a sheath. If if it's worn on on your belt, you know, out on the outside, I I would believe it's it would not be concealed simply because it's in a sheath. I think, it has to, I think it has to be basically entirely concealed and not, you know, so the handle sure. and that and everything. Can we make sure on that as yep, we I can move forward on this? That. that was the only thing that really came up to me just to think about it. It's something I remember in the past. <clears throat> All right, and we did have another person that was going to do a testimony on this also. Yeah, I believe uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Schneider here from the John Schneider. Magazine. Thank you. Counselors, I know everybody's here late, so I'll keep it as brief as possible. Um, about a year ago, we started getting uh, at uh, the magazine. We do an arts and entertainment publication. Excuse me, sir. Could you identify yourself? Sure. Uh, John Snyder. I'm the sales and marketing director for 605 Magazine in Sioux Falls. Um, we do an arts and entertainment publication, and uh, generally we, you know, deal with fun stuff, but people have been writing and asking questions about, you know, I, I carry a pocket knife, is that okay? And we ended up looking into it, and according to everyone, you know, normal people going about their day seem to be in violation of this, and um, it just didn't seem like it made a lot of sense uh, for people that are, for legitimate purposes, walking around on a daily basis and not bothering anyone to be breaking a rule. So we looked at possibly talking about, um, you know, updating this a little bit because it was in violation of the firearms, uh, you know, the state's firearms uh, exclusions. And we ultimately kind of um, wanted for uh, liabilities purposes, you know, like I said, we have our uh, employees go out and deliver magazines. Uh, I carry a, a folding knife for that. Our employees uh, often carry box cutters and things of that nature. But we just wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be uh, liable as a business um, if for, if an officer decided not to exercise discretion and uh, one of our employees got arrested, detained, or whatever the situation might be. Um, it, it, this seemed like a common sense thing to try and take people just doing things legitimately uh, and, and decriminalize that. So um, it's been uh, it's been about a year as we've been working through and looking at surrounding states and things that have worked for other states and we came up with the language that uh, well we uh, Keith came up with the language and it kind of met um, what we were hoping to do too so um, yeah that was it thank you any Thanks. questions from the committee comments any other public testimony on this issue I want to thank the assistant city attorney and uh, John, I, I think this was being proactive and moving forward on this. I think it's a, a, a great start here. Uh, any motions from the committee? What are, you, what are you looking for, Mr. Mayor, or Mr. Mr. Chair, sorry. Are we going, do you want it to go to full council as it is? I, I guess the, what I'd like to see is this go maybe to an informational so that the public yeah. gets one more opportunity to take a look and see what we're moving forward with and then take it to the council. Yeah, okay, I agree with that. I would make that motion. Second. All right, with that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, and that also passes. Next, we have chapter 18, ordinance revisions, recycling standardization by Bob Kappel and his team. 
Good evening. Bob Kappel with the Public Works Environmental Division. I'm here today with my team members, Dave McElroy, Landfill Superintendent, Amy Ladonsky, our Sustainability Coordinator. It's a pleasure to be here again with you. If you recall, we gave a presentation to this Public Services Committee two months ago. And at that time, we relayed that the city staff and city administration had decided to basically pursue one single focus strategy to assist us in improving our waste minimization and waste diversion goals. And at that time, uh, the city, your committee it took no action, but did ask us to come back to the committee with any proposed changes to our program, and that's what we're here for today. I want to let you know that I'm pleased to announce that our team within two months has successfully worked with the solid waste and recycling industry and the solid waste planning board and we have developed a strategy that we believe we are ready to move forward on. And that strategy includes some revisions to chapter 18 of our ordinances dealing with garbage and recycling. I'll try and go through this quickly as I possibly can since we are kind of times constrained here. This is mainly a background for your information to let you know that these are the highlight things that we have taken place as a team. Uh, we've uh, devoted quite a bit of effort into this. Uh, key points is that we've met with the uh, presentations with solid waste and recycling industry. We have had two meetings with our solid waste planning board ordinance subcommittee, and we have had two solid waste planning board meetings since we originally proposed the uh, decision to uh, move forward with the recycling standardization. We have also had private meetings with some of our haulers. We've had some private meetings with the uh, recycling facilities, Millennium Recycling and Advanced Recycling. Um, and there's been significant effort and involvement in this matter. Uh, just for a, a brief synopsis here on what are we talking about, uh, uh, methodology dealing with to improve uh, waste, uh, to, you know, to standardize recycling is there's multiple methods out there. And through the process, we have decided that the best option for what we believe in our city and our region is to move towards single stream recycling. And just to explain to the public or anybody who doesn't understand, source separation is a recycling methodology where you separate uh, all the containers that from different materials into different containers where single stream basically you take all recyclable materials and you put them into one single container. Another few things about the difference between those two major recycling methodologies is that source separated uh, recycling generally has fewer recyclables collected. It generally has a lower participation rate by the customers and is also generally considered a cleaner product with less contaminants. Where single stream, it is easier for uh, the customers to understand. It is less, there is less psychological barriers to recycling and it is generally a higher contamination rate, but there's been significant improvement over the last decade in the separation technology and that technology continues to improve, which is reducing those concerns. The major reasons why we have chosen to move towards single stream are as follows. The, one of the biggest one is convenience to the customers. It has been shown nationally and locally that single stream is just easier for a citizen to get involved with recycling. Another major thing is significant improvement in public education. If you recall, that's probably one of the biggest thing that concerns our staff. Our hands are fairly tied in public education because we, as you know, we have you know, anywhere from 30 to 40 garbage haulers that uh, do things differently. We have different recycling facilities. There's no standardization. There's no consistent uh, message that we can sell. All we can really tell the, the citizens of our region is to, that you need to recycle and why. Uh, so if we go to a standardized recycling method, that will assist us to greatly improve public education to all uh, citizens within our region. Another important one is that at it, we looked at other options and we believe it would be the least impact to the solid waste and recycling industry. And the major reasons for that is, is that haulers using single stream currently right now uh, approximately hand manage about 88% of the solid waste in our region. So in essence, most of the waste handled in our region is already handled by haulers that are doing single stream. So the small percent or small, small amount that have to make the switch. Another thing is significant private industry uh, has invested infrastructure in our locality, which we're very fortunate. There are other cities that are our size that don't have this infrastructure private investment that is here to assist us. 
Another major thing is the higher recycling rates. Nationally and locally, it is very, it's shown that uh, single stream does a much higher recycling rate than versus other methodologies. For example, locally, which we want to focus on, is that in 2011, if you remember the statistics that we showed, we had a 15% recycling goal. Every hauler that exceeded 15% recycling rate used single stream. And again, emphasize, every hauler that was above 15% recycling rate used single stream. The second statistic, just to show you, is that we have shown that locally, single stream haulers overall achieved a 21% recycling rate in 2011, where the garbage haulers that use source separated or other methodologies achieved only a 12% recycling rate. This is just a table you can take a look at at your discretion and your time. It just lays out the haulers in 2011. The blue ones were haulers that use single stream. The yellow haulers were using source separation. And green was a hauler that used both methodologies. Just for reference, to let you know that we don't do this in a vacuum. The city does have a solid waste planning board. It's one of the largest boards that the city has. It's uh, represented by individuals of the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, uh, Citizens Sioux Falls. It's also represented by a hauler and recycling uh, industry representatives. There's representatives of the five counties within our region and also the city of Madison. It includes public work staff and also includes a member of the multi-housing association. So very well-rounded representative. The solid waste planning board is necessary because of the, we are, do have a regional solid waste uh, uh, facility that we serve. And at this time, I'd like to share with you what the board has proposed uh, to the council to consider as we move forward. To give you a breakdown on the uh, efforts that were made, uh, on April, uh, April 3rd, we had a solid waste planning board where we gave a presentation to the board uh, about waste minimizations, which can also included recycling standardization. Uh, the board basically referred us to go to their ordinance committee to pursue options uh, to consider. On April 23rd, uh, city staff uh, met with the Solid Waste Planning Board Ordinance Committee. Uh, industry and city gave presentations dealing with recycling standardization. We offered the two major recycling facilities within our region to give a presentation on the benefits of source separation and single stream. Uh, at that time, the Ordinance Committee supported the decision to pursue single stream recycling and they asked the city staff to basically move forward and to develop programs and ordinance changes to move in that direction. On May 21st, we basically again met with that solid waste uh, ordinance subcommittee. Uh, just to let you know that there was unanimous support of the proposed ordinances that we are bringing forward to the committee for consideration to move into single stream recycling. And then also on May 22nd, we also met with the full solid waste planning board. And again, there was unanimous support and proposed ordinance revisions, revisions for single stream. One thing I want to share with you that's really, to us, us is really exciting. This board has been very active, very involved, and their high participation rate. In these four meetings, we probably achieved around a 90% participation rate, which I believe is excellent. The ordinance subcommittees, we basically had 100% members that attended those meetings, which were seven members. So it shows that it just wasn't a few people being involved. And the other thing, too, I want to share with you is that one member that is on the Solid Waste Planning Board recused themselves just because of the potential perception of a conflict of interest of moving into single stream, which I think was a very positive and, uh, measure made by that individual the board. I'm going to just briefly uh, go over uh, in your package you received the presentation and also you received a, uh, a handout that shows the a tracked format of the proposed changes of Chapter 18. Bottom line is we're making a definition that says single stream means a system in which recyclable fi fibers, including but not limited to bulk rate mail, chipboard, corrugated cardboard, magazines, newspaper, and office paper, and recyclable containers, including but not limited to glass, metal, and plastic, are commingled for collection into one container instead of being sorted into separate commodities and multiple containers. 1817 is being proposed to incorporate the single stream into that section of the ordinance to basically mainly require recycling, uh, residential recycling to 
pursue single stream. And it's important I want to emphasize that that's all we are proposing at this time is to pursue single stream for residential customers, not for institutions, businesses, uh, industries, and commercial establishments. 1821, we're incorporating uh, single stream into that part of the ordinance. And the important thing I want to point out here is that first highlighted section where we've added that recyclable materials not otherwise being managed and self-hauled by the residents shall be deposited in a proper single stream recycling container. The reason for that is we do not want to tell citizens that they have to single stream all recyclables. We know there's a lot of nonprofits out there that use recycling materials as fundraisers. Personally, myself, for probably 15, 20 years, I have pulled apart, pulled apart my aluminum cans. And I've used those for fundraisers for my church and also allowed them for my, my own children for a uh, learning a business concept of uh, getting money from an effort they've chosen. 1823, we're uh, just adding the single stream into there that says apartment. Uh, garbage recycling also has to uh, perform uh, single stream recycling. Uh, 1824, this is probably the meat of the ordinance, basically saying that standardized uh, recycling, is, uh, recycling collection is required. Uh, the first section basically is property owners or tenants shall store recycled materials separately from the garbage while awaiting collection in accordance with the following standardized recycling collection methods. And then second, it says licensed garbage haulers shall collect and transport recyclable materials in accordance with the following standardized recycling collection methods. And then there's two methods. And again, to emphasize, first section says that residential sites shall use a single stream methodology for collection and management recycled materials. And the second section, again, separates out non-residentials. Sites may use either single stream, dual stream, or source separated methodology for collection and management of recyclable materials. Another change we made is identifying name, just basically telling the haulers they can name their containers for recycled materials or single stream recycling. And the last change is mainly a cleanup. Uh, we've seen some significant improvement by some of the haulers getting into recycling that maybe weren't there before. And we're noticing that there's some problems with, uh, they have closed containers, but they're adding racks onto their trucks or cans or dumps you know, to throw recyclables in and there's a greater potential of those plastic jugs blowing out while they're transporting them. So we're saying they also have to basically ensure that that is protected. And then, um, Finally, I guess we'd like to, at this time, make the recommendation to this committee, and we hope we can get your support and referral of our proposed ordinance revisions to the full city council. And one thing I'd also like to touch base with you on, uh, uh, Chairman Anderson, you basically asked a question, what does it cost to basically start a garbage hauler license in our last meeting? Uh, we had some difficulties in getting direct answers from current haulers to answer that, uh, so we made a shot at it here to give you an idea. Uh, they have to have a license from the city, which is very nominal, $100. Uh, they have to have a rebuy ordinance, have a packer truck that can cost anywhere from fifteen dollars to $175,000. Uh, they have to have workers' compensation and vehicle liability. So just to answer your question from the previous meeting. So okay. I guess we'd like to open it up at this time for any questions or comments. Any questions from the committee? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to open this up uh, for just a few minutes so that we can get ready for the council meeting. Uh, any public testimony? Councilors Perry Shamp with Marv Sanitary Sioux Falls. Um, I see this is coming. Uh, I still do source separated, but we'll be coming this way probably. Um, the only thing I would like to uh, comment on is uh, when this goes to the final uh, council, uh, I would like to see, uh, I don't know what the time frame is, is if this passes. I mean, I've seen things come before the board, before the council. Looks like it's going to pass. It's a slam dunk, but it hasn't passed. It doesn't pass. But if this, I would like to see something, some terminology in there that the ordinance doesn't take effect for uh, at least two or three months. Um, there's gonna be significant changes that have to be made for those of us that, uh, we know this is coming, but I don't wanna hire staff right now. Um, so I'd like to see at least two to three months minimum uh, before the ordinance actually takes effect for me to uh, purchase additional trucks, uh, add staff, whatever I'm gonna need. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public testimony? Good evening. Um, 
My name is Lori Cressman with Advanced Recycling, and um, I, I firmly believe source separation is the true green way to recycle. But I would like to support the effort that everybody has put forth and to increase the quantity of the recycling. Um, but I really don't want to jeopardize the quality of our recycling. Um, I have a concern with glass being allowed to be included in the single stream. I have toured several facilities, four in Wisconsin, one in Iowa, a couple have been Minnesota, and they're brand new facilities. Some are a little older, ranging from $4 million to $25 million facilities, very state of the art. Uh, four facilities in Wisconsin, they do have glass in their single stream, and all four of them commented they said if there was any way possible to keep the glass out, do anything you can to do this. Um, it, it creates problems with equipment, safety issues, and of course, the contamination. You do have more contamination with single stream, but the glass is a severe contamination when it comes to the paper products and the cardboard products. And the mark marketability of the product that you have from single stream with glass in it. And then the glass that you receive out of there is a very costly item to ship. Um, I have had contact with the mills and their concerns with the glass contamination in the product and the problems that it does cause for their equipment. Um, the facilities that I toured in Iowa and um, I, I did not tour the M Minnesota ones, but their comments, they do not allow glass in with their single stream. And their reasons were um, they did the research and they checked with what worked with other cities and they just didn't want to go that route with the single stream because of all the problems that it did have. And, and their huge issue was, again, the marketability of the material. Um, I know that um, Omaha, when they started out with their single stream, they were recycling glass with their curbside as a source separation, but when they went single stream, they did keep the glass out. And, you know, I would like to support allowing our residents and, and the people of our five county area to consider, uh, continue to recycle glass, but to have a separate, um, whether it's locations um, for these drop sites at the recycling facilities at the landfill. I know Omaha has a few places throughout the city. And so um, those are basically uh, my comments. And again, I am in support of the single stream, but I really would like to see the glass um, not allowed to be recycled in with the single stream. Thank you Thank for your you. time. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, with this short time here, we do need to get moving for the city council. Do we have a motion from the committee? In the interest of time, can we um, defer this to our next meeting? I'm not sure that we're ready to send this to the full council. Yes, no? Council Aguilar, any comment? Bob? No, obviously we're open to any suggestion or direction that you have. But just to answer the one question about the glass, that is kind of a controversial issue. In 1821, we have basically provided an opportunity to resolve that problem without a delay. Uh, the last part of that section says a, res a resident may be directed to provide specific handling techniques like placing shredded paper in a clear plastic bag. That is intended to basically deal with those issues. So it should not be an issue to prevent us from addressing those issues that are brought up by the recycling community. I believe we are prepared to move forward at this time. So, okay. And then also, uh, Bob, I'm going to question you on the uh, time period when you want this to actually, this ordinance to actually kick in. Could this be something that we say could start at the first of the year to sure. allow the... Uh, haulers or those businesses to prepare for these changes? Sure. We surveyed the haulers and eight haulers that are doing source separation. As part of the survey, we received responses that they would need from three months to a year to make this switch. And we are open, and I know the administration is open to, 
if the ordinance is adopted to basically allow an implementation phase period. So, thank and you. And we'll have those changes when we do the next presentation. Okay. Mr. Chair, I would move that this um, be taken to an informational meeting and, and move toward the full process of the, going to the full council. Second. Okay, with the motion and second, all in favor say aye. 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 And that passes and will be moved to the <coughs> informational. Yes. Okay. And we need to uh, adjourn, Mr. Chair. We do Chair. need to adjourn. Open discussion? No. No? Okay. Uh, with that, the public services meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>